Charles was uh, fair with the president, because after Dick Cheney, no one has done more to fill this room than Barack Obama. <laughs> saying is that he's going to kill us or he's going to cure us. Uh, we'll find out which soon enough. Uh, my business is to make a toast to the Claremont Institute and to Winston Churchill. Uh, I'm going to speak for three people as I do this, uh, feeling entitled to do so. Uh, two of them are here and one of them is deceased. Uh, Peter Schramm, the first president of the Claremont Institute, uh, best man at my wedding, husband of my sister. Chris Flannery still works there. First man to greet me when I arrived in Claremont, California in 1974. And the late Tom Silver. Uh, we planned all this. Uh, we were too stupid to know better. We had everything except uh, practical knowledge. Uh, we all kept on our desk in those days. Uh, we wrote it out in Greek, a phrase from Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Which means the things of friends are in common. Now, we had this idea. We didn't have anything else, but we had the idea. Um, the people who come later, uh, we hired them, and uh, they seem like kids to us now, except, wow. Uh, we saw pictures of John Eastman up there, and uh, we hired him to run the print shop. And that's got to be an incredibly dumb thing to do. He actually did it fairly well. <laughs> and you know, he's going to be the next Attorney General of California. <laughs> About Brian Kennedy, I will say that uh, if he, in fact, were Ben Bernanke, we wouldn't be in this financial mess. <laughs> Anniversaries are embarrassing for people who were there at the beginning when they all started because uh, we look so old now. And also because uh, those of us who were there at the beginning can't help but remember what it was like. Uh, I'm actually going to tell one quick story about that. I remember one night we were planning the Claremont Institute. We were still graduate students. It's a miracle we finished our dissertations. And uh, the subject came up, this kind of subject almost never came up in our lives. The subject came up. Were our student loans going to be a problem for us somewhere down the road? <laughs> and that was the kind of thing that we thought was ridiculous to bring up. And it was settled. We were uh, south of railroad tracks in Claremont in a bad neighborhood where our apartments were, because all we could afford. We used to drag two Formica tables out and have dinner under the stars and drink cheap wine and eat badly cooked pork chops. <laughs> Peter Schramm was the pork chop chef. <laughs> and uh, one night we had this short discussion about this, and I remember it was settled, and it didn't last long, and it was settled satisfactory by Tram holding up a glass of white plunk and saying, uh, well, anyway, we prefer to live as gentlemen. <laughs> 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 sort of away with his glass, and oh, yeah, okay, that's it, that's how we're doing. <laughs> what are we going to make of these 30 years? Because it's a simple fact that we set out to stop the very things that are happening right now. And we foresaw them. And so the question is, are we failures? Winston Churchill entered politics in the year 1900. And so, of course, he passed his 30th year in the year 1930. And if you read his speeches in 1900 and 1901 and 1905, they sound uh, better than any right, but they make the same points. And so he had set out in 1900 to stop the things that are afflicting the world today. And in 1930, the first socialist prime minister had been seated. He thought that was death. In fact, in 45, he said at the peak of his power, the socialist government cannot achieve its ultimate aims without the use of a secret police, I mean a Gestapo. Strong thing to say in 1945, and in 1930, they had first taken power. In Germany, elections were underway. 
There were a series of five of them, and they were fought out in the streets by thugs in uniform, some of them communists and some of them Nazis. And the German people were learning for the first time to fear. And in 33, of course, Hitler would be elected. Stalin held Russia in its iron grip. These were all things that should have been imposed. The policy in the West was overwhelmingly disarmament. In 1929, an international treaty to which the United States of America was a signatory was passed that outlawed war. It uh, didn't work. <laughs> the wall was broken. And so what Churchill saw was his life in tatters, outmaneuvered by Stanley Baldwin. After decades of high and precocious office, he would spend the next 10 years isolated, even with his golden tongue. People would not come to hear him speak. He uh, flirted with bankruptcy repeatedly and almost had to quit. What lesson can we draw for us today? He did not seem to be demoralized by this, although of course by this, although of course he was profoundly disturbed. He had said in a 1919 a letter to his good friend Lord Beaverbrook, who had written a book about the First World War, unteachable from infancy to tomb. That is the story of mankind. And of course that is a gloomy thing to say, but it's also a hopeful thing to say. And you could draw two lessons from it, and we should all draw here tonight. Just like Churchill tonight, we feel the uh, disappointment and the despair and the fear that comes from being in a grand position and knowing what the threats to it are. We have all lived through the Reagan years. The Claremont Institute lived through the Reagan years. We've seen uh, Dick Cheney at the peak of power and his wife, Lynn, one of the most important people in various administrations in Washington, because she is a thinker. And just like Churchill saw all those great things happen in his life, and then he sees the year 1930, and the year 1935, and the year 1940, when he wonders, do we have a month left to live? And the lesson that you have to draw from that is perseverance. You're not to quit. It does not make any difference if the cause for which we stand is eclipsed, and even ultimately and fatally eclipsed. Because we did not choose it because we thought it would be successful. Indeed, when we started the Claremont Institute, it looked terribly difficult. We chose it because we thought it was right, and that means that events don't really affect it very much, do you think? And Churchill, he just kept going, you know. And then one day, somebody put up a billboard in London because he was being proved right. And he was being proved right because he had the force to speak, whether anybody would listen or not. And this man bought this billboard in there and said, what price Churchill question mark? And the next thing you know, Adolf Hitler made the mistake of turning his back on England and going toward Moscow. And he forgot that the person in charge now was not somebody who would quit. And we are here today, and Ronald Reagan got his chance, and Margaret Thatcher got his chance. Because first Churchill got his chance. And we here today, we get our chance. Because Churchill got his chance. 